we sat and we just sat and sat for hours. I tried to read the newspaper but couldn't concentrate on it because I was nervous. I wondered how much extra fuel we had because the rule of thumb is you have enough for the alternative airport and they're supposed to have an extra 45 minutes of fuel beyond that. So roughly three hours or so of fuel they had to have. And so after we'd flown three hours, I began to get nervous. Suddenly, an alarm breaks the tense silence in the cockpit. It's a warning that the plane has less than 30 minutes of fuel left. I need to tell the passengers. There's no need. You know what I'm going to tell them? It's out of my control. The aircraft is going to crash. Gonna die. We're going to die anyway. So shall we kill you? No more talking. Don't worry. I have the axe. Please. At least let us attempt a controlled landing. I will die along with him. I will show him that I have guts. It's finished. We will die together. With almost no fuel, Abate decides to make his stand. We came over the island. By then fuel was running out. I decided, no, we should not go any further than this one. And I started circling that area. But how can he convince the hijackers to let him land? He'll have to find an answer soon, or Flight 961 will crash into the sea. For three hours, Captain Leola Bate has been fighting a lonely battle. Hijackers have taken over his passenger jet. They want to be flown to Australia, but Abate doesn't have enough fuel. Warning alarms are already beginning to sound. An airport on the Comoros Islands is within reach, but the hijackers refuse to negotiate and won't let him land. At stake, the lives of all 175 people on board. They took whiskey from the duty-free, and they wanted me to drink, actually, but uh, I refused. Once again, alarms sound. One engine is now completely out of fuel. It's shutting down. Captain Abate is quickly running out of time. With the airplane being at 39,000 feet in cruise flight, the airplane is not going to run out of gas with each engine simultaneously. There'll probably be a bit of a lag, which in this case there was. The right engine stopped functioning first. The first thing I noticed, the engines sound different. Because there's only one engine running. It had a much deeper sound. Abate follows standard emergency procedures. He starts the APU, or auxiliary power unit. It's a generator that can supply extra electrical power when one engine is lost. Most of the passengers don't know how serious the situation is. But Captain Abate knows the plane is in grave danger. I lost the engine at 39,000 feet. I cannot keep on flying at 39,000 feet with engine failure. With thrust from only one engine, the aircraft immediately slows down. At a lower speed, the wings don't provide as much lift. Abate must descend to an altitude where the air is thicker. Denser air means the wings can provide enough lift to keep the aircraft flying level. The plane continues to descend. Even with only one engine, and despite the drop in altitude, the tiny Comoros Islands are still within reach of the crippled airliner. There is an airport at the capital, Moroni. If he can convince the hijackers, Abate could land there. It's gone down a thousand. When the engine stops, it descends. It will descend whether you like it or not. Alone in the cockpit, Captain Abate takes a dangerous chance. He explains the situation to everyone on board. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your pilot. We have run out of fuel, and we are losing an engine at this time. We're going to make a crash landing. When the pilot came onto the public address system and said that he had no alternative but to crash land, that is when we, it actually dawned on us and we realized that this was a life and death situation. 
Captain Abate also makes a desperate call for help. We have already lost one of the engines. He wants the passengers to overpower the hijackers so he can land the plane. I ask all passengers to react to the hijackers. Thank you. Captain Abate knows the call for help is a huge risk. Even though I was expecting some kind of uh, movement in the cabin, but I, I, I had to do my job. I was doing what I had to do. You know, keep the airplane in control, fly it. While Captain Abate waits for action, the passengers are more confused than ever. He said, react against the hijackers, which is an odd phraseology. Nobody reacted. I think part of it was the way he said it. It was not sort of a normal way in English that you would ask someone to take on the hijackers. But he also was trying to do it enough so they wouldn't notice what he was saying. At least one of the passengers does understand. As a news cameraman, Mo Amin has never shied away from a challenge. Amin makes his way to the economy section in the rear of the plane. Here is a man who had spent 20 or 30 years in some of the most difficult and dangerous war zones of the world, who'd been beaten up, who'd been uh, shot at, who'd been jailed. He was a kind of alpha male, if you know what I mean. He could talk anybody into anything. He made it like he was going to the bathroom, and then he came back and he started talking to people who were three or four seats ahead of me. And from his gestures and actions, he was trying to get us to stand up against the hijackers. With your help, we can take them. There's only three of them. Come on. Come on. Not knowing what would happen, not knowing what these people were capable of doing. And, um, of course, the fact that they had indicated that they would blow up the plane if anybody tried anything. Always, always have to measure Am I going to make the situation better, or am I going to make it worse? Who's ready to take the chance that your precipitous action against the hijacker might not cause him to set that explosive device off and take the life of everybody on board the plane? In the end, the passengers choose not to act. Captain Abate is still alone against the hijackers. In the cockpit, the hijackers tried to take control in a vain attempt to keep the plane in the air. It's descending. Don't worry. I'm not the one who's doing that. Inadvertently, one of the hijackers disconnects the autopilot. The plane swerves wildly. Don't move! Listen! I am not applying any motion. The aircraft is doing it by itself. He was trying to fly the airplane, he was trying to disconnect the autopilots, all, all sorts of things. It's all over. We will drop in the ocean. 31! Abate makes another attempt to explain the desperate situation to the hijackers. Perhaps they will finally allow him to land at the nearby airport. This is zero. And this is coming to zero. I prayed to God. I wish I wasn't in this situation. Now I am in it but help me to save these people. Ladies and gentlemen, please sit down and fasten your seatbelts. Do not panic. Please I'm starting to say, oh, I love you, dear. It's been a good ride. My wife is sort of unsentimental, psychiatric nurse. And she tells me, get up, stand up, get our bag down from the overhead, pull out your extra glasses, put them in your pocket, and get some food from me. And I want this, this, and this from food. She had carefully picked things that wouldn't make her thirsty. She said, there's not going to be any mail service once we hit the water. Finally, the plane runs out of fuel. So you're killing everyone? That is all. Sit down. From now on, you can't do anything to me. What? From now on, you can do nothing to me. The other engine stopped and it sort of went quiet. Then it started to get hot within the cabin. The light started to flicker and gradually it went out. That's it. Both engines are out. That's it. 
Is this what you wanted? 